Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. In Philippians chapter 4, we're going to talk today about finding contentment either with or in life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Finding contentment in or with life. We'll be reading from Philippians chapter 4 starting in verse 11, down through verse 13 for our main text, and then we will go from there. Hallelujah. Paul writing here, now he says, Not, I speak in respect of want. Now here Paul has been talking to the uh, Philippians about giving and about their, you know, their gifts to him and so forth. And so I said, but I don't speak in respect of want. In other words, he's not trying to manipulate them into giving. We do not need, to, you know, listen, if, if people would follow the heart and follow the word of God, we wouldn't have to, well, we don't, we shouldn't be manipulating no matter what. But people do. They try to manipulate people into giving things. You know, they try to, they, they make statements that are just thoroughly unscriptural. Um, and, and honestly, we cannot live that way. You can't give because you want to be like everybody else with, you know, uh, I've been in meetings where one person got out, went through money on the platform, another one did it, and all of a sudden everybody's doing it. And you felt this pressure to go do it because everybody was doing it. That's the wrong reason. You can't, that's not faith. That's, you, know, you know what your reward is? The pressure to be like everybody else is relieved. That's your reward. You're not getting a hundredfold. You're not getting a tenfold. You're, not, you're getting the pressure off of you. We have to do everything by faith. Amen? Now, if God says go give the preacher some money, go give the preacher some money. But, you know, in my old, my, in, my old, in the old days, you used to call it a Pentecostal handshake. Nobody knew it except the preacher and the one giving them the money. They walk up to you. Take the hand, slap it, and when they pulled it back out, there was a green, there was some green in there. Now it's called a Pentecostal handshake. Or, you know, <clears throat> now that was, see, well, I was supposed to have money. No, 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 it was supposed to come my way. It's a Pentecostal handshake. You <laughs> initiated. He's out of here. All right, just throw him out of the game. He's won the money. But, uh, you know, uh, people that had in the heart to do something like that, they did it. Now, nobody knew about it. It wasn't a show. It wasn't a display. It wasn't everybody started responding because somebody else did it. And, and, and I've actually, have, and I have had at the most in one day two, two handshakes like that in the past. You know? And you just, you know, and, but nobody knows. it. See, that's, a, that's an act of faith. Because God spoke to somebody and they did it. But everybody trying to copy what everybody else is doing, that's not, that's not faith. You, you won't get in trouble and you won't get a reward. Everybody say glory. So Paul says here, I did not speak in respect of want. In other words, I'm not trying to, you know, tell you that I, oh, you got to give or we're going under next week. Oh, dear God. You know, we don't have enough to make it through. We're going under. Well, we're not going under. We're just going to obey God. Amen? And you know, like one brother Hagin said one time, he told the Lord, live or die, sink or swim, go over, go under. We're going to do what God told us to do. Amen? Now, he understood, you know, he, you know if anybody understood faith, he did. That he, he was going to make it. He was going to go over. He wasn't going under. But you have to come to the place of commitment that no matter what's going on, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Everybody say, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Let me say something, folks. When you do what God told you to do, sometimes it looks like you're going to sink. And it looks like you're, not going, you're going to go under. And it looks like you're not going to make it. But you know what? You've got to obey God and do what God said anyhow. Amen. So Paul says, I don't speak in respect to one. I'm not trying to pressure you. I'm not, for I have learned. This is why Paul's not. I've learned. That whatsoever state I'm in, that therewith be content. Now, you, you, you know with the English language and people, and people preaching sermons, they take that to be content. That means you just put up with whatever you got going on. Bless your darling heart. I'm just telling you something. God makes some folks rich and some folks poor to teach compassion to the rich people. Bless their hearts. What happens when that rich person doesn't learn the compassion? Bless the darling heart of the poor person. They go under too. No, that's not how God, God doesn't make some folks rich and some folks poor so he could teach rich folks compassion. You know, there's a world we live in. There are circumstances people are born into. There are things of life that happen. Amen. Amen. People make mistakes. I mean, you know, the company cut back and people lose their jobs. I mean, things happen. But Paul said, I've learned to be content. Now, to be content could really mess you up if you don't have the right definition. Amen? We need the right definition to understand what the word content means here. And really, in the Greek, it comes from a word that means to be self-sufficient. 
I've learned that whatever state I am in to be self-sufficient. Now, Paul is not talking about self-sufficient in that I'm a self-made man because he says over in um, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians, in the third chapter, in the fifth verse, not that our sufficiency is of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. What he is saying here is what the 20th century New Testament says in this verse when it translates this verse. Wonderful translation. I, I went and found me an old 20th century New Testament. I mean, it smells. It's so old. It was made in 1910. I mean, <clears throat> but I got it offline somewhere and found it. It had been rebound, but it's the old pages. I mean, it's old. Just so I could have proof that I had that this verse is in there. The 20th century New Testament says, Do not think I'm saying this under the pressure of want. For I, however I am, 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 yeah, I am on. I'm not hearing myself come off the wall. So sometimes it's, it help, I, I start over projecting. Um, for I, however, I am placed, have learned that I love this. Everybody say, get ready. Get ready for a heavy ready. I like heavy readies. Amen? I don't like weird readies, but I like heavy readies. Okay? He says, I have learned to be independent of the circumstances. That's how 20th century New Testament says this. When Paul in the Greek says to be self-sufficient or not, what is he saying? I am not dependent on the circumstances of life to govern whether or not I'm going to make it or not make it, whether I'm going to have joy or not going to have joy. I mean, no matter what situation I am in, I am independent of those circumstances. <clears throat> he goes on the next verse and says this, I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to suffer hunger, uh, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, uh, I found a translation a number of years ago, and here's how it said this. He said, I have learned how not to have enough and not lose my poise. I've learned to have too much and not lose my head. Amen. Amen. See, circumstances can mess you up either way. Some people say, oh, God, if I just won the lottery, everything would be all right. Remember that guy a few years ago up from Kentucky or West Virginia, wherever? He won the 200-some million. I think he took the payout of 80-some million, you know. And, um, and, and he's dead now. His granddaughter was, was, or was either raped and murdered or something like that. He got caught going into like a strip club with a half a million dollars in cash in a briefcase. Now, what did he say the day he won? I'm going to tithe to the church. I don't think the church ever saw it. And he just, he, what happened? He had too much and he lost his head. Hey, man, he just lost his head. Now, you got people over here who don't have enough, and they're losing the poise. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, Lord, if you don't do something now, oh, I'm going under. Oh, I'm going under. That's losing your poise. Are you here? So you, <clears throat> Paul said, I have learned not to have enough and not lose my poise. I've also learned to have too much and not lose my head. How do you do that? The previous verse, I've, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. Too much or not enough doesn't govern me. Because my sufficiency, I am self-sufficient in this way. I am self-sufficient through the sufficiency of God. I have you know, enough when I don't have enough because my God supplies all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I have stability when I have too much because God gives me the wisdom on how to handle it and use it for the kingdom, advancement of the kingdom of God. He gives me power to get wealth that I may establish his covenant in the earth. I know that we've preached that a lot um, uh, in the past few years about that it's a covenant of prosperity. And I think more it's getting out there and winning the souls for the Jesus. It's building orphanages, uh, not building orphanages, but supporting missionaries and ministries around the world that are in places you can't get to and they, and they need the money. I, right now, I know, I know a missionary in Estonia. That's Estonia, not Gastonia. Some people think I'm saying Gastonia when I say that. Estonia. It is the most northern Baltic state below Finland. Hallelujah. And uh, I know a missionary, and, and there's some of these guys who have all this money. If they just gave him what they had for one year, the excess they have, it would support his ministry for five, six, seven years in that nation to do the work of God. God wants, God's not against prosperity for his people. God is against crazy prosperity. I said God's getting crazy. If all you can think about is getting your money and being on Robert Leach's, if he's not on TV anymore, but if he were to come back, make a comeback, lifestyles of the rich and famous, and there is Jeff Gale and his yacht down in the Bahamas. Hallelujah. If that's all you can think about, you got, you're losing your head. Amen. See, our focus has to be on the heaven. The word of God says, set your affections on things above and not on the earth. I am not against prosperity. We've got to have it to do the work. 
We got to have people in the kingdom of God that God is blessing and they're, they, they learn how to get money and they can give and they can, we can do the work of God. We can reach the lost. We can, we can get people healed. We can get people filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. We can build churches. We can go all over the world and preach. Praise God. We got to have the money to do it. So we can't preach be poor. Well, God, don't, I just want a little old log cabin over in the corner of heaven. I don't want a log cabin. I got one up in the mountains, my wife's family does actually, but I don't want to, I don't want to live in one in heaven. Hello? I want to live on the one that has the streets lined with the Carolina flags. Y'all heard that joke before? Krzyzewski dies and goes to heaven. And uh, he gets his place, and it's just all right. And, you know, he, he's, and finally, he just after, after the Lord's given him a tour, he says, Lord, why do I get this house? And there up on that hill, this huge mansion, lined with Carolina flag. Why does Dean Smith get that one? And the Lord said, that's not Dean's, that's my house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I don't want a little old log cabin over in the corner of heaven. God, God has promised to bless his people. So we want to make this balance. The balance is God wants to bless you. He wants the blessing of Abraham to come on you. He wants the blessing of increase and multiplication to come on you. Yes, glory to God. But we have to be independent of the circumstances so that we can keep our heart right and our attitude right and our motive right so that if we have too much, we don't lose our head. If there's not enough around, we don't lose our poise. And we're doing the things God called us to do with the money to reach the nations of the world. Praise God. Amen. So God does want to bless you. Coming in and going out. When you lie down and when you rise up. In the city and in the country, praise God. In the fields, in your cattle, I mean in your vineyards. God wants to bless you. <clears throat> it is the promise of God. But you've got to become independent of the circumstances. So if, you know, payday don't make it in when you think it should, God don't always pay on Saturday, but he always pays up. Amen. I said Amen. And listen, you don't need to take some blessing and go blow it all. Like I was sharing with this guy. He ended up, I mean, he ended up dying, and he took all that, he took millions and millions of dollars and just wasted it. You see, I know Christians right now, they talk, oh, I just want to give to the kingdom. I want to get rich. I want to get rich. And boy, if, they got, if, they, if, the, if the payday came in tomorrow, you wouldn't see him for four years. They'd be out the door going out and just doing whatever. You can't lose your head. We have to come to the place. Where, where, where we, are, we are now in a, a, a communion with God that the circumstances of life does not affect that communion, does not affect who we are, does not affect how we act, doesn't affect us <coughs> when we don't have enough. Well, I sure would like to have too much. I've seen people never lose their salvation over having too much. Hello? You've got, to, you've got to come to this place where Paul was. I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. I've learned that my sufficiency comes from God. That whether I win the lottery next week and have millions or I'm over here and I, you know, I lost my job and I don't have, you know, it doesn't look like I'm going to have my next meal. <coughs> God will take care of your next meal. You don't know how many times in the past couple of years I've looked at it and thought, dear Lord, I mean, you know, your, your brain's going, if we don't have a miracle within the next 10 days, we're, we're under. And every single time. Uh, well, wouldn't I like to be living on the other side of that thing? Where in the next 10 days, I'm going to give away enough money to bless five churches or something. I'd, I, yeah, I'd like to be over there too. Sometimes you're not there. And if you're not there, you can't lose your poise. If you're not there, you can't get all grumbly. You can't become, you know, you can't, be, you can't become an Eeyore. You got to be a tigger in life. <laughs> you know, bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. You know, you all oh, no matter. I mean, you know, we're just going through life. I mean, like, uh, was it Pig Pen from the Peanuts Gang? That cloud just follows him around all the time. You know, you know, I mean, there's some people who walk into a room and the lights go out. We don't need to be like that. We need to be full of joy. And we got the victory, amen? See, when you, that happen, when does that happen? That happens when you become independent of circumstances. In other words, they are no longer the governing factors of your life. Who is? I've set my affections on things above and not on the earth. See, we're compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses. Amen? Let us, run, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the developer, the beginning, and the developer or finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. See, when you get your focus on, when you get locked into God, when you get into where it doesn't matter what's going on around you, you're in tune with him. Money can be flying all around you, and it, you're not going to jail for, for uh, crazy stuff. It could dry up, and you're not going to fall apart because you're now independent of those things. They don't govern your joy. Hallelujah. Now, we all like, we like listen, we're charismatic. I'm Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, crazy matics, cruise matics. I mean, all kinds of matics. We believe it all. Believe in healing, believe in the gifts of the Spirit, believe, you know, believe the Word of God, believe God wants to bless us, God wants us healed, God wants us, we can live by faith and not by sight. We, we have all that going on. But I'm telling you, you either can shout when the, when, when the bad times are, because there ain't need to shouting when the good times are if you can't shout when the bad times are around. Why? Because all that shows is you're, you're, you're dependent upon the circumstances. Now just bobblehead it now, come on. We just, just bobblehead. You know, if you can't, just say amen, bobblehead. Can an ouch, an amen, or help me, Jesus? Any one of those will work right here. All right? Paul said, you know, it's, it's the external things, materialism, circumstances, do not produce joy. They don't produce strength. They don't produce satisfaction with life. I am telling you, no matter how much you do, it's never enough. Have you ever seen rich people stop buying and getting more and more and more and more? They're just never satisfied. It's never enough. Let's be real about it. When, when, when materialism becomes your God, there's never going to be enough. It is a drug. And how about how, how do alcohols and drug addicts act? They, this little bit's not enough. They've got to have a little more. You know, they've got to have a little more. They've got to have a little more. They've got to do, the, do a little bit more. Got to do a little bit more. Got to do a little bit more. Why? Because it's never satisfied. Why? Because the external can never satisfy the heart. We have to satisfy the heart. And it will appease the external. And when you're satisfied in your heart, then when the, when the too much comes, it's just a tool. When the not enough is there, you're in tune with him who is your supplier. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Hallelujah. People would get me, listen, Christian, oh, it's getting this hot, man. Uh, this is a, that time of year where they turn the heat on and it gets hot. If you turn the air conditioner on, people are cold. Uh, you know, here's a dilemma. We got a lot of Christians who become dissatisfied because of what others say. Can I say something about our prosperity teaching? Some of us in excess. Brother Hagen called all the prosperity preachers in before he went home to be with the Lord and had a big meeting there in Tulsa. And he sat them all down and, 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 and he took out his notebook and set them on the table. And he brought, I mean, I'm, I'm, you name them, they were there. Or he called them to come. Some didn't come. But I'm, I, if, you name, if you start naming names, I could say, yeah, he was there, he was there, he was there. And he said, guys, you are not preaching anything new. He said, everything you're preaching was preached at the end, back in the late 50s and early 60s, and during what was called the latter rain movement. That's when they were restored, apostles, prophets, evangelists, preachers. Those gifts were restored as far as teaching in the body of Christ. He said, I got the notes right here from what they preached. And it's what you're preaching right now. He said, what happened was they got into excess. See, this truth. You always have, it always starts out with truth. But they got into excess, and it killed the move of God. It didn't go good. They got mad. Some people got mad with him. We got books coming out on prosperity that he's saying that, you know, you're in excess on that. Now, you can't call Dad Hagen your spiritual father, and then when he calls you in and says, here's what you need to do, you need to, you need to balance this and back it up some. You're teaching it too much in excess. So we got people now who, who have given out of not faith, but out of mimicking what other people are doing. They didn't get a return, and now they're dissatisfied. They didn't get the return. I said they didn't get the return. Why? Because it wasn't an act of faith. We have to do everything by faith. Like I said, it's all right to give to the preacher, but you don't have to have the whole church go up and stuff money in their coat. Right. I've, listen, I've done it. Been right there in the meeting and done it. And you know why I did it? That's how I can preach this. Everybody around me was doing it. I looked unspiritual. So you got to act like they're acting. Hello? Even one meeting I was in, the guy came out, and he, wore, he didn't wear a regular coat. He wore a, 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 like a windsuit coat that had a stretchy bottom and had it unzipped a little way. 
The money didn't fall out when they started stuffing it all in. He was prepared. That's right, he was prepared. <laughs> every service, every meeting, that was going on. And finally, something just struck me wrong, and I realized this isn't faith. We were in excess over here. Okay? People expecting some major multi-million dollar return next week. Got one guy, he's got a television program for years, you know, pay your thousand dollar vow, send your thousand dollars, and they put testimonies to people's houses got paid off. Yeah, how many got paid off and how many, how many hundreds, hundreds of thousands didn't get a thing? Amen? I, I love good testimonies, but I, I love good Bible-based action. Amen? You know, the Bible, doesn't, the Bible says not the most of the oxen that trade without the corn. The labor's worthy of his hire. Uh, the ones worthy of double honor, especially the labor and word and deed. I get that. I understand all of that. You could take all those things and preach them in balance and it'd be a blessing. You can get them out of balance and get, in, and get into error. We don't want to get out of balance. Amen. We don't want to be. So, so others, others start seeing oh, other people got lots of money. And, they, and, they, and, they, and then uh, unanswered prayer. We give and we go, oh Lord, bless my life because I did this uh, unanswered prayer. Failures. We may, how many of you have ever made a mistake? That cost you financially. Come on now. We've all done it. Every one of us in this room have made mistakes in the past somehow financially that cost us. Well, you can't quit there. Amen. Shortcomings. You know, there's just things that happen. So we become dissatisfied because of these things. And then, you know, what happens? We're over here in this abase, but we're not, we're, not, we're not keeping our poise. We're losing our poise because we, the pressure, the day-to-day -day pressure of finances. This did a, this did a satisfaction. This did a set. It didn't take me a whole lot to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I got right into tongues. Hallelujah. This dissatisfaction is a result of the believers depending on the external to satisfy the internal. Now, we're not to minimize the reality uh, of hurt that people go through. People go through tough stuff. I mean, I'm, listen, people go through hard stuff. We went down to, uh, to, uh, about a month ago. Has it been a month ago now? We went downtown town and we fed the hungry and we fed the poor. We, we, we passed out blankets. We, we blessed them with toiletry cases, bags and stuff. We ministered to 166 people in about three hours. Praise the Lord. We're going to do it again before Christmas. Amen. This time we're going to do a hot meal. We're going to do something hot. Okay. This was sandwiches and stuff. It was, you know. But we went out there and ministered. They're hurting. And it doesn't, we're not, I'm not trying to minimize the hurt people go through. I'm not trying to minimize the difficulties people go through. But as a believer, we cannot let these things control and govern us. Oh, is that pictures from downtown? There you go. Didn't take them long to do that, did it? Hallelujah. That wasn't in my, that, I didn't have that plan, by the way, guys. Okay. I want to show people how to overcome. See, we can overcome these things through the word. Of the, what They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, praise God. We can win. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, praise God. That's where our name came from, 1 John 5, 4, for a faith and victory church. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The victory that overcomes the world is our faith. Yeah. Glory to God. Amen. Paul emphasizes this point in Colossians 3, 2, we've already quoted it. Set your affections on things above and not on the earth. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can't do all things. I've heard people preach. I've heard preachers quote it. I can do all things. No, you can't. I can do all things. No, you can't. I can do all things through Christ. Say, I can do all things through Christ. Why? Because he strengthens me. Praise God. Amen. Lack doesn't bring defeat, and neither does abundance bring victory. We need that choir, Jeff. Hallelujah. All right. Anyway. And by the way, I'm singing in choir, and I have a microphone. And they can't turn me. You better not turn me off. All right. <laughs> Paul's life. Look at 2 Corinthians. Run over to 2 Corinthians real quick. Y'all mind running over there with me real quick? We're going to get out of here. and Worship guys got, got to going this morning. Hallelujah. Eight into my time. How many will give me till 4 o'clock? One, two, three. All right, come on now. Three, hallelujah. Can I get another one? Glory to God. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> listen, listen to what Paul says. Now remember, he said, I've learned how to be a base, not have enough, not lose my poise. I've learned how I have too much, not lose my head. But he gets over in Second Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, he's arguing his case with, with bozos. Now sometimes you deal with bozos in the church. Yeah, you do. He says in verse oh, um, 
21, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. How be it, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? Well, so am I. You know, they're bragging about, well, I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm this. He said, well, I'm all these things. Are they ministers of Christ? I am more. Now listen, in labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. That's 39. Five times. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A day and a night have I spent in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils in waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. Boy, he covered all the bases, didn't he? His own countrymen. His, the the uh, church. And then false brethren. <coughs> There's nobody left. He covered them all. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness. Besides those things, that which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. Then he goes down to the next verse, in the uh, next chapter in verse 7. He says, And thus I shall be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger, the angelos, angel, of Satan sent to buffet me. It was not optifamilia. Hello. He said it was an angel. It's not, he didn't have, you know, by Old Testament said there'll be thorns in your flesh and pricks in your eyes. He did not have a person in his eyeball. He didn't have to stick it out their side. He just told you what he had gone through through that buffeting. That, that demonic spirit came to buffet him and to buffet him and to buffet him and to buffet him and to, you know, buffeting is like slap, 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 slap. Uh, ever seen a boat at dock and the, and the water just constantly beats up against it? That, that's being buffeted constantly. No matter what you do, it's there. And Paul said the messenger of Satan, the angel, angels, in the Greek it's angel, it's a word for angel, uh, sent to buffet me. And for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. See, this is where Paul learned to be abased and not lose his poise. Because he went to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm about fed up. You ever gotten there? I'm about tired of this. Come on, Lord, I've had enough. And don't, don't look at me in that sanctified, holy look. <laughs> because if you hadn't said it, you thought it. And the Lord said, I have given you a grace to put up with it. Now that's how we teach it. That's how the majority of the church teaches it. He's given us a grace to put up with it. But the Lord said, and he answered and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. This is why you can't take a definition that they've come up with and shove it in everywhere in the Bible. The Greek word charis can mean gift, it can mean favor. Here, and, and here it's a gift. What is the gift? It's not favor. My divine favor upon your life is sufficient for you. I'm getting my teeth knocked out. I don't need any favor. I need some answers. Come on now. No, what he says here is my grace is sufficient for you for my strength. It's a gift. It's, the gift. it's a gifting of strength. And this word strength in the Greek is dunamis. Miracle power. For my miracle power is made, is sufficient for thee. Woo, yes it is. When I reach all I can do. Hallelujah. So what does he say? More, more, in my weakness, is, uh, in, in weakness, my strength is made perfect in weakness, or my dunamis is made perfect, or brought to maturity, or brought to full force in your weakness. Hallelujah. Most gladly, therefore, I will glory in my weaknesses. Infirmities is weakness in the Greek. And my weakness is that the power, again, the word dunamis, of the anointed one may rest upon me. Oh, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Paul finally got the answer. He had been beat. And he says, I've been, I've been in all this mess. And finally, I got fed up with it. And I went to the Lord three times and said, hey, I am about tired of this stuff. And Jesus comes back and says, my dunamis, my miracle power is enough for you. And when you've reached your weaknesses and you've reached the end of your ability, my dunamis power 
comes on you. Paul said, Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. He might, he might. Hallelujah. I preached at a church one time. This, this old African American gentleman. I was preaching like crazy. I mean, I was spitting cotton four rows back. And he got up. He couldn't do anything, but he grabbed the hold of the end of the pew and he just stood there like this. That's all he could do. He was getting blessed. Hallelujah. And there was a sister behind him with a hanky, and she was doing like this. And the more she did that, the harder I went. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. My strength is made perfect. My strength comes into full manifestation when you've reached the end of your ability. <clears throat> there he's got the hanky out. Come on, pastor. Oh, my God. We have put so much dependence on things. We've used grace in the wrong way. We think grace means I can do anything and still go to heaven and still get blessed. No, grace, this grace right here is nothing about going to heaven and getting blessed. This grace right here is a strength from God that when you've encountered things you don't know how to overcome, when you've encountered things that you just, you're just this is knocking you back and knocking you back and you're saying, no, I'm going on with God. And when you've reached the end of you, there is a dunamis miracle working power that comes out of the anointed one that comes and rests upon you glory to God and raises you up and empowers you to do what? To win! Glory to God! Puts you over the top! Glory to God! I hear the Apostle John over in the epistle of first, I mean, yeah, the epistle of first John, crying out, saying the same thing, just in a different way. Because he, he finds a place in his life where he goes, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. My God. The grace of God is not about you getting away with everything and trying to live any way you want to live and somehow or another, no matter what you do, you don't have to repent and you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. The grace of God comes in the hour of need, praise God, and empowers you to walk out the purpose and the plan of God and do the will of God and could do it victoriously and to overcome, hallelujah, as a created being in Jesus Christ, the power of God making you rise up be the church of the living God. Carry out his will. Carry out his purpose. Hallelujah. And Paul said in walking out with God, I've been places I didn't have enough. And when I reached my end, his power took over. Glory to God. And I've had times where we just had plenty to sit in the ministry. But I kept walking with my God. Because I knew that could be gone any minute. I have a relationship with my God. And his grace, his dunamis power. Man, I, just, I can't wait till I walk it out. I just don't have anything left. Because <laughs> here it comes, baby. Hallelujah. I said, here it comes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. In that moment, in that hour, when I've reached the end of Ed, when I've reached the end of my ability, when I've reached the end of my thinking, when I've reached the end of everything, here it comes. Woo! Glory to God. Here it comes. The grace, the strength, the dunamis of God comes and rests upon me. And just like the prophet in the Old Testament, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Get on your chariot and get back to town. And then he came and the Bible says he girded up his skirt and began to run and the hand of the Lord came on him. He outran the chariot. Now the king doesn't have some old lazy, you know, put out the pasture, you know, gray mare who's about to fall over any second. The king gets the best horses and the best chariots. But the hand of the Lord came on the prophet, and he outran the king's horses. Hallelujah. It's time to gird up our skirts again. It's time to let the hand of the Lord come on us again. It's time to breathe in out of, that, out of the presence and the glory of God and knowing that no matter what's going on around us, good or bad, the evil or blessing, in the middle of all that, we choose life, we choose blessing, and we're running with God in his hands his anointing, his grace of strength, the grace of dunamis power is coming on us. <laughs> I feel like being in the preacher's wife movie right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what, what's his name? The, uh, 
Greg something. He, he passed away a few years ago. The bad guy in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, y'all, y'all remember y'all remember that movie? Remember him? He's one he was the rich guy. That boy got so good. He's got some his smile is so greasy you can fry chicken on it. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Greg, I forgot his name. His first name was Greg, but he was a dancer and stuff. Um, Greg Greg Hines, Greg there you go. I mean he's out there this and that sermon. He's ah <laughs> I'm telling you, it's time to get some more 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 people just getting their eyes on the Lord and just getting excited about Jesus and just knowing that no matter what's going on, it's all it's all all right. You gonna you gonna save that song, get it saved. <laughs> Yeah, took so one of them old beach songs, one of them old, I uh, guess, old Motown beach songs and, and got it saved. It's all right, yeah. Okay. There you go. Hey, that's where we are. What can I do? Preach, hallelujah. Are you facing tough times? Are you facing difficult times? Paul said, in all these things, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. Hallelujah. Where did it come from? You know, it came from the Lord. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, it's, 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 you gave me to four, I got two more hours. Somebody say, but my roast is in the oven. On, well, put it in the crock pot next week. It won't burn up that way. I'm not going to keep you that long. Hallelujah. I promise. I'm beginning to close. What's that mean? (laughs) But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content, independent of circumstances. But they that will be rich fall into temptation. If we start, all we can think about is getting rich to get out of our mess, you fall into a snare. And the many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. While some having coveted after. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about having too much, not losing your head. You can't begin to covet. You can't begin to covet. Amen. Have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Honey, the lottery is not your answer. Now, if you win it, glory to God. But I'm telling you, it's not your answer. Because if you're not here where I'm talking about right now, you win the lottery, we, we, you're gone. You're gone. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness and fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. We have to be after eternal things. Oh. And then when the other things don't go what we think they should be going, we're, we're, we're connected to eternity. Now, I'm not telling you go through and be broke all the time. I'm telling you get your eyes in the right place and God will, God will take care of you. We've got to get back to believing God's going to take care of us. And get your eyes off of, because I gave, to, I gave up to the prosperity preacher, I'm going to have a supernatural debt cancellation next week. I gave up. I still got a mortgage. And I mean, listen, we have got to get back to being balanced and biblical about things we do. Amen. 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 Now, I give to certain ministries because I love them and I love what they're doing for the kingdom of God. I've supported Kenneth Hagin Ministries all these years. Why? Now, I support others, but I why? Because that's where God sent me. He sent me to go to Bible school there. Dad's my spiritual father. He's gone to heaven. Yeah, but I still listen to his tapes and stuff. They're still good. They're still anointed. He still speaks. Even though he's dead, he still speaks. And we got, we got what, one, two, three, four, five. We got five Raymond grads in here. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, two, three, four, five, six. We got six Raymond grads in this church. We love Dad Hagen. We love the ministry. Amen. And we've always supported that ministry. I don't support it because I want to get rich next week. I support it because of the work of God they're doing, and we want to see Raymond go forth. That we now have over 180 Bible schools around the world. When Dad went home, we had two. We had Tulsa, and we had, um, we didn't even have two. I think at the time he went home, we went down to just, just Tulsa. 
But Pastor Hagen's taken it and, and, and had a different vision, uh, or not a different vision, but opened up the vision to carry out. There's now over 180 around the world. We have over 11,000 students. We had 2,000 when Dad went home in Tulsa. We now have over 11,000 students every month in Rainbow Bible Training Center somewhere in the world, all combined together. So we're supporting that. Why? They're training up ministers to win their nations for Jesus. I do it because it's, we do it because we want to bless the kingdom of God. I'm not giving up so I can get a, a return next week that I, oh, praise God, I'm going to be out of debt because I gave the rain with this week. I'm more interested in how many people got filled with the Holy Ghost, how many people got healed, how many people got born again, how many more campuses have we extended out to, who's being supported, who's doing what for Jesus. I'm more interested in that than, than some kind of whatever. God will take care of us. God will bless us. God will, God will bring us to where we need to be. We support because we want to help. If you're looking for a ministry, to, I'm going to give to that ministry because I can get a hundredfold return next week. Don't just keep your money. Keep your money. And, don't, and if he's telling you to do it, don't you listen to him. We give because we want to help. There are people dying and going to hell. There are missionaries who need our help and our assistance. And I want to give and bless them. Ken Cassick and Estonia has called us several times over the years. He said, he said Ed, we've we got to have this money to, right now for the I'll take up an offering this, this Sunday, Ken. We take up an offering and, and, and then wire it to them. Because they have to have it to get something done right then. They, gotta, they have an emergency need. We know, them, we know Ken and Danny, and they're just a lovely couple. They're a wonderful couple there in Estonia. Doing a work for God. I've been over there and preached in, in five different missionary trips. I've gone there. Benny went with us one time. Hallelujah. Wonderful people. Wonderful people. We just want to bless them and help them. And that's where we got to get to. Amen? I said, that's where we got to get to. How did I get off on that? I don't know. Oh, oh. Getting, you see, you're losing your head. We don't want to lose our head, do we? <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5. I'm getting ready to wrap it up here, guys. What does that mean? Well, you get what you say. You have what you say. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5. Let your lifestyle, conversation lifestyle, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Oh, my. This is back to what Paul said over in, uh, you know, to be abased and not lose his head. He'll never leave us or forsake us. You might think he's gone, but he ain't gone. You may not feel like he's there. You can't go by your feelings. Your feelings are flakier than a charismatic. Hello? You know what it says? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. What's that mean? In that tough place, guess who's right there? The Lord's right there. I said the Lord is right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't finish it, people, because that because it'll take me another hour. And I know y'all said four o'clock. We do have to get to a funeral. Hallelujah! Listen, look at second, uh, Philippians. We'll close right here in Philippians, right here. There, I am going to. I am going to close right here, in Jesus' name. Lest the Holy Ghost transfer me to somewhere else. Now, if He He leads me somewhere else, I got to obey Him. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, we're going to stop right here. I'm closing my iPad. <laughs> and I just lost my place doing it. All right. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, hallelujah, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I'm calling you by the word of God, by the Holy Ghost, back to a place where Coming to church is not about getting the next, next latest, greatest revelation of how you can be rich. God wants to bless you. We've taught that. I'm calling you back to the place where you're pursuing with all of your heart. As the deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth after thee. It's in a dry and thirsty land. Panting after God. My, ordinate, my, my graduation service at Rainbow Bible Training Center was preached by uh, a, somebody might be possibly well-known, or Roberts. <laughs> and he preached tracking with God. That was, our, that was our graduation sermon. 
And you use the scripture in the Old Testament that says that, as the, talking about the hinds feet. When talking about the hinds feet of a deer, we, we didn't know, but you know, when the deer is running, he puts his front, his front hooves down, and when he pulls them back up, the rear feet come up and hit in the exact same spot and pull forward. And he preached on us tracking with God. God is the front feet, we're the hinds feet. And wherever God leads us, we track with God. And God leads us and we track with God. We follow after God. And when you follow after God, you always end up where God wants you to be. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So this one thing, I count myself not to have apprehended. This one thing I do, I forget all that stuff behind and I reach forth unto the things that are before. It doesn't do you any good to worry about what happened last week. You can't live in the regret of the mistake you made five years ago. What does it do after that? I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We've reached the place we have to track with God. We're the hinds feet he's leading. Let's just be, be, they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We press toward the mark. We, we relinquish the old stuff. We let go of mistakes we've made. We let go of all this stuff. And now we press. We press. I'm independent of not having enough. I'm independent of having too much because now I'm focused on the goal that is set before me, the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I'm running the race with him. Glory to God. And Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy. Just about want to cry when I think about First or Second Timothy. This is Paul's last two letters. And he's writing to his protege because he's about to be offered. He said, I'm ready to be offered up. But he said this, I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown. Glory to God. Paul, at the end of his life, he referred to himself as Paul the aged. Right into his young protege, Timothy. I've kept the faith. I've fought a good fight. I've tracked with God. Notice Paul didn't say, I've got four yachts and three houses. Paul didn't say, I've got $60 million in the bank. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I obeyed God. And along the way, I learned that not having enough or having too much doesn't mean anything. I found my sufficiency in my walk with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when I lay down at night, I close my eyes and say, thank you, Lord, that even in the weakest places I can be, your dunamis power comes on me and puts me over to empower me to finish my course. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.